Hello, welcome to this episode of Beers and Bites, hosted by your co-host Jeremy Murdershaw of Fortify 24-7 and Chris Jordan of Fluency Security. Here with us this evening is a very special guest, and I'm going to try the Italian uh, enunciation of his name, Cristiano Gerardini. And uh, he does go by Chris for short, so uh, please we'll welcome him, uh, his company is the turnkey technologies and he's the president owner of the company and he has characterized his company as biz apps and cross cyber so i'm intrigued for this evening to go through and understand a little bit more what that means and uh, we'll go ahead and get started right now with mr jordan if you would please demonstrate your beer for the t uh, audience All right so you know i'm a fan of the double ipas i only got one tonight because of lent and we got uh, this one's fiesta from boston uh, Boston's a, another uh, Virginia brewery. This is a, a nice double IPA. Uh, it's pretty solid. I look forward to it. Um, I'm trying to, you know, drink my way across the state. How about you, Jeremy? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to drink my way across the world. Although today I've got a couple of different ones. I'm going to pick up uh, your slack because you're, uh, you're on Lent. But um Keeping with uh, last week's theme, uh, this is a gluten-reduced beer. It's not a gluten-free, so it's a little heavier. It's a 7.7, .7, so get our good old friends at Stone Brewery. And then I've got the, uh, the six-point uh, Bengali. I'm going to try this one out. And uh, your second beer, Chris, is going to be a Golden Road Brewing uh, Media Noche IPA. Oh, I, 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 that's, that's okay, too. That's okay. Yeah, now you didn't go 76 today, huh? No. Uh, all right, Mr. G, what'd you bring to the table? So, so my choice tonight is, is I'm, I'm a fan of Blue Moon. So Blue Moon is one of these nice, smooth brews. And I've actually had a half barrel on the other side of the house here that we sit out poolside in the summers and just enjoy it. And uh, it's it's a favorite. So anyway, that's what I brought tonight. Awesome. So. Perfect, per perfect for that warm weather in Texas. <laughs> we're well, much better we're much better this week in st louis folks so yeah yeah well we were 80 degrees here today and in less than a week ago minus 15 with the wind chill so and at eight inches of snow on the ground and a, a half inch of ice so thankful for the uh the nicer weather for sure all right so we're going to bring in on our alaska theme uh from last week where i'm continuing now with a low ipa which is 4.5 percent but it's still an Indian pale ale, and we'll see how that goes this evening for us. Nice. So with that, uh, Mr. G, see we have two Chris's on here. So if you could, I'm intrigued about the business. I mean, you've been around since 94 with the business, and you've, you've obviously made a name for yourself in the industry. And this notion of biz apps, obviously, you know, that's probably going to be ERP and CRM and stuff like that, right? Uh, but I'm intrigued about the cross cyber aspect of that. So if you can talk a little bit about the company, what it is you do and how you help clients in today's environment, sure. that'll get us started. Absolutely. Uh, appreciate that. And uh, so really turnkey technologies, uh, we're a very focused organization and uh, we describe ourselves as a dynamics uh, partner for Microsoft. Uh, at a high level, we implement ERP and CRM solutions. So we are a, uh, after 27 years, we are a tier one Microsoft uh, CSP uh, direct distributor. So we buy direct from Microsoft and we primarily distribute the 98% uh, Microsoft Dynamics. The other 2% modern workplace, that's the office apps, but really just a, a laser focus on Dynamics. And about 85% of that mix is ERP. So we represent it these days, uh, Dynamics 365 is the big product. There's a small, medium and a medium large. And so if you think about ERP and like Mike, you know, and again, so full service, full licensing management, everything you'd expect there, full implementations, migrations, um, very service focused. It's about 50, 55 to 45 service for licensing. Um, the comment about cyber is, as I read the backgrounds on the folks I'm with, you know, ERP is, um, is we look at addressing certain parts of the market in the, um, the defense contractor space. I mean, like there's a whole new role when ERP used to be able to install on servers and nobody cared about cyber or security. And so that's, as I read the backgrounds, I thought, hey, cyber and biz apps. And so we're really, we're a biz apps partner. We do application software. We don't do any infrastructure. We certainly depend on and partner with organizations to have the infrastructure ready to deploy the applications on. But in the context of, of the Microsoft cloud, there's a commercial cloud, which doesn't meet um, DOD cybersecurity requirements that are emerging under CMMC. So as you look at the, the new challenges for biz apps providers like our organization is, okay, we have to deploy those apps into now a secure environment. 
changing the rules. It's all changing and it's it's happening now, as you're probably aware, Chris, based on your background. So um, yeah, there's a lot of requirements that start showing up as that. But uh, traditionally, my staff is uh, full of accountants and engineers. So I spent uh, my, I'm a double E comp sci math who, uh, when I switched to computer science, mom and dad said, get a job. And I ended up in public accounting. So accounting and technology. And I, so I've been doing accounting software for 30 plus years and thus the ERP. But uh, again, it's, it's business process automation. Um, again, a lot of highly credentialed professionals, again, accounting and technology and uh, nice focus. But again, the cyber thing, I think it's an interesting conversation is, you know, for, for you individuals, as you look at, you know, cyber audits and CMMC and, you know, okay, infrastructure. And now can I come into the building and actually do the work now that we have, you know, secure facility per se or secure infrastructure. So uh, it's, uh, it's a changing landscape. I'm, I'm sure that. Uh, so, know, so Chris, before we go too deep, let's go into the Microsoft dynamics of 365 per second, because it's, it's, I don't want to call it the redhead stepchild of the Microsoft world, right? Um, it, 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 you know, sometimes you get, I got Office 365, where's my dynamics, right? Um, so can you go over a little bit of the history of dynamics? Obviously, you know, it came in after you started. I don't think dynamics was around. Sure, sure, sure. So right? you're exactly right. Microsoft was not in the, the biz app space to the degree they are today. And it began in 2001, where uh, they bought out a, a North American based Great Plains software who was based out of Fargo, North Dakota. So my earliest as I got kicked out of the house, I bought Great Plains software from a guy in the mid 80s and learned Great Plains. And so I've been around the product forever. Well, I had a dealership when I started Turnkey in 94 and Microsoft came in and, and bought that dealership uh, in the US for a billion three in 2001. So they got Great Plains software, which is now Dynamics GP. And they also acquired Solomon, which is now Dynamics SL. A year later, they went to Europe and they bought uh, a Dynamics AX and Dynamics uh, Navision, Exapta Navision, another billion three. All of a sudden, between 01 and 02, Microsoft is now in the biz app space. Here we are 18 years later. They spent about $19.2 in R&D last year, and they are in it to win it. So to that point, um, they've, they've made mistakes on rebranding. People are like, you know, Dynamics 365, finance and supply chain. Oh, that's AX, right? So the, the legacy customers. And so and even on CRM, they changed the names. And, but that's why there's been a little bit of a... I think some delay in the market is just because of rebranding, but uh, it's really been gro growing in momentum over the past few years, quite frankly. And so. how is that doing against the, the likes of uh, Salesforce and others out there? It's a great point. Um, Salesforce has got the brand recognition to just everybody. You, you've got somebody in the organization that knows Salesforce. And so there's a lot of adoption to Salesforce because of that. But to that point, Microsoft doesn't always start with the best product, but they'll outperform. And today, Microsoft Dynamics customer engagement outperforms Salesforce. And so that's becoming evident. And, and part of that is the, uh, the advancement of the Azure and the analytics and the commingling of artificial intelligence into the solutions to the degree that nobody else has. It's doing marketing insights, customer insights, sales insights. Even now on projects and in the ERP, the AI bots are in there looking at your ERP data and they're starting to say, hey, you should do these things. So, so they're running away with it, frankly, but um, to that point, they, 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 you know, they spent a lot of money trying to figure out to call it Dynamics when back in the 90s, it was called Dynamics and you, you get it. That's just, that's sure. Microsoft. So. Sure. And then on the ERP side, there, there's, there's, got, there's a lot of competition out there. So talk about that a little bit and some of the challenges sure. that you're trying to overcome with that. It's, you know, and there's, there's the price points, right? And I say that, hey, we've got small, medium and we've got medium large trying to take people from QuickBooks or Peachtree or Sage or any of these older products. You've got NetSuite out there. You've got Acumatica out there, which was Solomon. All the Solomon guys went and built Acumatica. They may not like that, but, um, and, and so there are some small mid-market products out there. And um, a lot of people underrepresent what it costs to do the solution. And then you get in and once you're committed, okay, then you spend more. So there's, there's challenges on how transparent are you on the actual cost, but um, well, there's there's good competition and there's and like I said, there's some good competitors out there from that. So are you finding a niche market with your uh, Dynamics 365? We do. We do. We focus. Um, we do a lot of manufacturing. And so as we advertise core manufacturing, um, medical devices, aerospace, um, you know, uh, electronics, even foods. And, uh, you know, even on the small side in St. Louis, you know, I've got, I've got a lot of the food guys. I got Volpe meats. And if you like prosciutto, they're the largest prosciutto manufacturer in the U S and, you know, we've got coffee companies. We got Louisa foods who makes pasta. So we've got a lot of food. We got a lot of medical devices, people that make uh, a lot of cool stuff. And uh, so manufacturing is a niche and, and we really go deep on that. And again, I've got a lot of engineers and then professional services. So we're a professional services firm. And as we've innovated for ourselves, 
we've got good solutions out there. And as you try to get um, government compliance and DOD compliance, you, you achieve that through augmenting these solutions to capture more data to comply with uh, federal audit requirements on cost plus accounting and things like that. So a lot of accounting, Definitely. but those are niches for us and people show up. So our phone rings, you know, we do outbound demand marketing, but people find us because of our expertise. So we, we operate across the U.S., we're authorized for Latin America. We're Microsoft Latin M CSP. We're also getting our government CSP. So we've got a lot of credentials. We're established with distribution on the uh, Western Europe so we can distribute new data centers in Europe. So we've got pretty big coverage. Um, we've got a bilingual team. That's why the whole Southern hemisphere is accessible to us as well. Sure, so, sure. So there, the final question that I'm gonna ask the other guys sure, to sure. jump in here, but What's been your experience from the company overall with this COVID pandemic that's been hitting the market? You know, it's it's interesting. I'm in a CEO group and we talk about it. Last March 13th, that was it. Everybody left my building. So we own a building here in St. Charles, Missouri, a 11,000 foot building. And we used to have 45, 50 people showing up and now nobody does. So a year later, everybody's remote. In fact, since COVID struck, we, uh, we've hired 12 people and nobody's in St. Louis. We've got Three in Georgia. So we got a team in Georgia, three of them. We've got three in Houston. We've got three in Minnesota, three in Chicago. We've got some West Coast, some East Coast. So our workforce is all over these days where traditionally people were relocating. So as far as the building, we're looking to rent three fourths of it and we don't expect to mandate people to come back. So the accounting and HR staffs are in there. But we really find that, you know, if people can manage themselves and we can manage them, that why would you disrupt it? And I think we're seeing that in organizations all over because it's a big conversation in my CEO groups is what do you do? What do you mandate? Do you force them? Manufacturers are different. Field service personnel are different. IT, we always work remote. We just hung out when we did it, right? So it was easy for us to just not go to work in the morning. So and that seems to be uh, you know, conceptually, or I guess in practice, in a lot of cases where a lot of companies are starting to say, hey, it's okay now with remote workforce. But the continuing big challenge in cybersecurity, as you know, is how do you know what these employees are doing right in these remote environments so funny we just looked at an app yesterday that does that type of monitoring and it's it's you know it's stealthy but to that point is you know as we look at teams we're like oh they're yellow they're not working are they you know so you're right managing productivity and we get a timesheet but we want to make sure there's not timesheet fraud and so you're, you're right and how much monitoring or do you measure user activity on the keyboard and they're always like, well, I'm on a VPN. You can't, no, uh, you get it. So yes, there is a, there is new technology out there to do that type of monitoring passively, just so you can find problems. You know, you don't want to, like I said, there's people, they're going to vary their work, their work habits, but uh, again, good workers, you, you get it. Product, it's productivity based mostly in our world. So there's not a lot Definitely. of fraud. You don't get room for fraud, I think in, in our, in our space anyway. Well, on the other side of that, we see a lot of, uh, <clears throat> a lot of people who are remote workers taking their home practice habits and using those on corporate assets. And, and that becomes problematic in terms of exposing corporate networks, in terms of the data, right? And all that kind of stuff. So a, a real big problem that a lot of companies are, are facing today. That is. Thankfully combined uh, between our two companies, we've got the solutions to handle that. Understood. And I think that's, we rely on, on partners like you all the time to deal with the client side in terms of, because they're, they're web-based apps and how do you authenticate and are you mandating multi-factor and do you have all the extra layers in there? And we just added Mimecast in our organization just for another layer. So we're not just relying on Microsoft technology. And uh, so I think that everybody needs to be aware of that. And especially with remote workers with bring your own device, right? I don't own the devices. So all of my 50, 60 people have their own devices. We provide them the laptops, but you're right. It's like, how do you control them, right? And that's right. Uh, you it, cyber it, guys know how to do that. So yeah, we do. <laughs> I know that's not what I do. You know, I'm like, like can you help, please? So, uh, so Chris, Jeremy, any any questions here? Chris, okay. I, I always start. He's yeah. always got questions. I I have yeah yeah. Whether anybody wants to hear them, that's a different area. That's, that's true. Um, you know, so so I actually because I think you're you're a rare bird. I mean, you look at the longevity of your company and how things have changed. And cybersecurity, I mean, I've been in cybersecurity since 91, even though I graduated 89. I had a couple of years where I actually didn't do security. Um, but, you know, my, my biggest question really is more, you know, what has cybersecurity changed? Obviously, it's changed drastically since you started. And that, where is the, it, where's the impact today? You brought up with, with the, the CMMC, which is the NIST 171 impact to contractors. 
and the difficulty of things like what's called FedRAMP, the inability really, you, you take a look at FedRAMP, it's okay for the big products, but the small companies struggle if they have their own products because FedRAMP requires 270 to 1.2 million to be certified, right? So the, the, it's one of these awkward birds because again, go back to the 171 and the inability for Azure Cloud commercially to meet the standards uh, that are in 171. And what we've seen from our side is a lot of companies, I don't want to say you do payola, but there's no way in the world, like the Meraki firewalls don't give you who's logging in at, on the control plane. That's obviously a no-go, but you, you see them used across the board in the DOD. Uh, what, where's the pushback? Are you seeing it more from the ethics of, of your customers? Or are you seeing it from, because I've really never really heard pushback on 171 just yet on commercial clouds. Yeah, and, and I think that the, the, the transactions I'm dealing with, because not it doesn't apply to all of my customers, but my defense contractors that have a percentage of their business, we're looking at almost a bifurcated model where part of their business is in the commercial cloud and part of it is in the GCC high cloud. Okay. And in the context, I've got you know aerospace manufacturers where we need to move up their CAD, it's got to be up there, the integration, the ERP, and the modern workplace, and it all lives up there. And then they've got workers down here, and they may have workers that live in both environments because they like the feature rush reach rich commercial so but but that's that's how they're attacking it still and you know we're not doing the infrastructure we're not doing the cmc audits or the security side but we're, we know that deploying into that high environment gets them you know, their little check boxes as part of their cmc you know level certification yeah i just I, I find it fascinating i mean i guess like let's start off i mean when it first started off the internet was i don't want to say brand new because it's been around since the 60s. But I mean, people really didn't start using it to me till, I mean, I had it in college in the 80s and I got in trouble because somebody thought they should charge me for a long distance communication. Um, but by the 90s kicked in, um, it still really wasn't a big deal. So you started what, 94? No, yeah, well, I started in 94, but I was, I, I got my comp sci and I came into the industry in 85. So I was working in public accounting then doing, we had the luggables and, that you're right. And we've watched it as it evolved. So yeah, I've seen this go from, and, and again, it's, when did it start getting tighter and tighter? You know, it, it, it's, it's been recent, even this, people used to get to self attest to, yeah, I'm secure, right? That's, that's the pre CMMC is self attest. But even to that is your point about the internet in the nineties, we're still doing, we're still doing Novell back then. In the early nineties, there was still Novell networks because of some of that. And then as you moved over, well, when did Windows server, whatever, or 2003 or whatever. I mean, it's again, you get it. There's There's been a rapid or a more rapid acceleration that I've seen, but um, yeah, I've seen a lot of evolution on tech, you can imagine. And, uh, and, you know, and, and but, I guess I'm going down this road is, is when did you start seeing the requirements for cybersecurity beginning to impact your business? Were you cloud, actually it really cloud wow. as we started seeing cloud apps show up, you know, on premise, it's almost like people never really thought about it and they never thought the, but as people, and again, I don't, was it, was it 2010 plus? I mean, it, it hasn't been past that. I didn't think it was early in 2000 people were so concerned because I don't know that the malicious, nefarious types out there were as aggressive or as, as active as they are. But again, it's at the last five plus years. But and to that point, we are a little narrow. So as we look at biz apps, we don't always hear what the network guys are finding either, unless we're personally experiencing it. And I ran a data center that I sold last year for eight years. And part of that was just the, the increasing threat levels from a data center standpoint, you know, that, you know. We, we joined a larger firm to, uh, to get better security and protection for that group of customers. And just to give perspective to all this, I mean, St. Louis is not exactly the boondocks, right? Um, I mean, I, I know a lot of <laughs> engineers who live in, and stay in St. Louis. They love it, right? Um, the old uh, Jet Aviation guys, all the IT staff still there. There's tons of businesses. Can you give the outline? You say you meet with other CEOs. You want to Give the lay of the sure. land. Sure, sure. In fact, my building, I'm in Missouri Research Park. So MasterCard is probably five miles down the road. They're, they're world headquarters. Across the street from me is Enterprise Holdings. Okay, so I'm out there. All the billionaires are on that side of the river because it's in a different seismic zone. And there's big, big bandwidth out there. So, but no, we're not. We're not a cow town. Yes, cheers, everybody. Um, <laughs> but uh, to that point, even the, the geos, the, the National Geographic Space, I mean, they've got a big federal Scots across the river. So there's there's pretty good pretty good activity here, but from a business climate standpoint, the city the city's been challenged, um, but there is a lot of large enterprise here, and it's 
It's right in the middle of the U.S. And like I said, there's a lot of power. So I mean, if you Google uh, St. Louis, I think the first thing you see is that it's a dying town. It's dangerous. People don't want to go downtown anymore. I, you know, it's got a bad rep. The city, I don't live in the city. I grew up in the city. I'm out in the county. The city is, in fact, I'm, I'm the partner doing the, the project for St. Louis Airport with the city of St. Louis. So we're putting in the new ERP in the city in the St. Louis Lambert Airport. And so even the the complexities of, of working with that and understanding the city is going to be sub 300,000 population. They've got an issue there because you're right. It's a bad rep and, you know, people are sprawling. And but with with COVID remote workers, people are leaving. People are going anywhere they want. Exactly. They don't feel like they have to be in the metro markets anymore. And that's just not St. Louis. That's everywhere. So um, but St. Louis still, again, I think there's there's a good future potential here. And, uh, you know, from a leadership, there's new uh, there's a mayoral race coming up. My Vistage group, so I'm in Vistage, but in that we got to actually talk to one of the new St. Louis City mayor candidates. Um, and again, there's there's a lot of money here. Don't get me wrong. There's years ago, 30,000 millionaires in St. Louis. So it's quiet, it's conservative, but there don't there's bank here. And, uh, so, so, but you guys are really strong. I know um, there's an Air Force base just outside St. Louis, which is the backup for the DOD search. Scott Air Force Base, right. Yeah, Scott. Um, but for the most part, when you think of St. Louis from an engineering point of view, you think of uh, hardcore IT techies, network and infrastructure techies. Uh, now we got Boeing. They're building missiles over in St. Charles. So where the harpoons are coming out of uh, Missouri, we've got we've got uh, B1 bombers. We've got stealths out in White Plains. Yeah. So they got, yeah, they got some know, stuff going on here. Hardcore, but you don't think of, of uh, you know, NSA and CIA. It's quiet, though. It's, it's quietly here is what I would say about yeah. that. So my dad, I was a space <laughs> brat. I grew up and my dad was with McDonnell Douglas Boeing for 40 plus years. So I actually saw a launch last week down in Cocoa Beach. So we're we're definitely into the space tech and, uh, you know. And so my question is, uh, what I'm getting to is you, you talk to other CEOs, how, how do you do the hiring to get good security people to help you in your practice? Me, I outsource that. Unfortunately, I don't put those people on staff because I don't need those resources because we're not selling security services. So we partner again, even some of the things you advertise on your sites. I've recently gone through some of that to make sure I didn't have a, uh, a penetration, frankly, because we thought we had we had an issue uh, a couple of years ago where somebody hacked credentials and spun up 75 servers in the Azure cloud for crypto mining. And after three weeks, I got a bill for $750,000. So we've, Ooh. we, we you know, and again, as you look at us man managing credentials for clients, if somebody got in and hit us, got clients credentials and started going in there. And, and, and so we, we needed to make sure that we're tight. So we've gone through our own, but I outsource that work. I don't staff those people at this point in time. It's yeah. a huge problem, interesting issue. I mean, Jeremy, because, because Quinn just finished up that uh, real-time billing system for AWS. And one of the things we didn't realize until, you know, I mean, we're, four or five years into it, is just how important it was that real-time billing because when mm -hmm. you get a bill once a month, yeah, yeah, a lot yeah. of times you're clueless why are you getting certain charges, you just pay it, right? And and I think one of the difficulties of cloud, besides security, I mean, I think there's a lot of issues with people not knowing cloud security, is cloud transparency as far as billing and what's actually going on because people, every everybody thinks it's fat, what is it called, fat containers. There's no credit limits, did you know that? <laughs> Unlimited credit limits on Azure. Oh, so it's like I was spending twelve hundred a month. Am I going to get seven hundred fifty thousand? I'm like, hey, why didn't I get a phone call? <laughs> um, and I think that, but post that, post all this remediation, multi-factor became a requirement for partners for Azure mm -hmm. and for the partners. So that all came as a, because yeah. of all these conversations and this stuff. We had, I mean, we had the FBI involved. We had a lot in Microsoft. You're right. We need to take it up a notch. Partners have to use because of the risk of that. And MFA takes care of a lot of those problems. Um, so but, MFA is huge. Uh, yeah. You know, Microsoft's changing also finally to TLS 1.2, which uh, it's only been on the books for 10 plus years as far as a federal requirement goes. But, you know, Microsoft catches up. One day they're going to have IPv6. Um, so and I don't speak all the security buzzwords that you do. So remember, I'm an ERP guy, frankly. Yeah, OK. Uh, you know, so let me so ask you a couple and credits questions. and cost accounting. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Jeremy, you're. I thought right. you're drinking. I thought that was your job this, this time. You know, I, 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 I got to hear my voice once in a while. Otherwise, I feel bad about it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I got some, some questions for you. Um, how does an Eagle Scout, how does what you learned as an Eagle Scout apply to your business today? How have you used That's what great. you got in that training? Great question. So when I do, I do quarterly presentations to my group, and when they get these uh, – you know, it's this expectations thing. We talk about it. Trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. But we go beyond that. We think about how do we want to be perceived? And so absolutely that Eagle Scout thing and you live it. And again, you want to exemplify it. But as you think about those words that people use to articulate you or describe you, we talk about it. Professionalism, responsiveness, 
you know, cheerful, because we'll do the Eagle thing. It's cheerful, thrifty. Thrifty, we want to be good with your money. Cheerful, be happy. You want to be friendly because some consultants are grouchy, but I absolutely, it's funny you brought it up, use that in conversations as I talk to the team because it needs to be inspirational, but they also need to understand is what's the imprint that I want them to follow? You know, I, I even give them copies of my presentations and deliver it and say, let me tell you what I'm saying about you so that you come in and perform to that expectation. But it absolutely does. And it's about doing it right and making it right. And I hate to make it right after the fact, but I will get my checkbook out and I will make it right. And, and I've got customers that know that and they know me, who I am. And, you know, I mean, I've, I've done a lot. I got a medal of merit back when I was 17 and people were like, well, what'd you do? I did something I shouldn't have had to do, but I did it. And even today I do stuff I don't want to do and I just do it. And I think that that is, it's, you know, I mean, again, I teach that to my kids and um, because you take it with you forever. So I'm glad you're right into that. I've had people that look at me here and they go, Eagle Scout, St. Louis U High, come on in the door. Because those two things right there, being a local guy, they're like, okay, we know something about you before you tell us anything. But, uh, but so absolutely. Without, without going down a rabbit hole here, um, what are your thoughts on the fact that on the news last night, I heard that a thousand young ladies were just inducted into the Eagle Scout rank? I think it's great. You know, my dad wanted me to do battle with the Boy Scouts because he's old school. And I'm like, dad, you know what? The, the, the training and the disciplines and the beliefs and the philosophies and what the kids can learn, it's agnostic. In my world, I tell people, colorblind, gender neutral, you know what, everybody, you know what, they can all benefit. And I think that was my conversation. My 87 year old father is like, look, yeah, they can all do for this. You know, don't get, don't get hung up on that. Drop the ego, drop the tone, drop the attitude and come on learning and their children, right? Boys, girls, they all need examples to follow. They all need leadership. 100%. That's part of the problem in this country is, you look at who's getting the right examples. That's a whole other topic. But so, yes, I, I don't see a problem with that at all, because look at look at a guy like me. I, I think more Eagle Scouts, they step up, they step up and they do try to do it right. It may not be easy, but they do. And, you know, like I said, it, it takes a lot to get there. And uh, it's just like a college degree. You accomplish something. It's just the beginning of the journey. Right. It's just That's right. So. And, and I think, you know, you, you'll hear a lot of companies say Eagle Scout, I'll hire them because I understand the leadership that they bring. And the I did. I hired right. one. I had a kid. I had a kid showed up and I went, wait, 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 no, wait, wait, let me go talk to him. And he's on board and he is amazing. <laughs> and again, my guys didn't see what I saw, but that was to your point. It's a little shiny token. You're like, you got to drill down on people that have demonstrated that that's who they are inside. You know what I mean? Yeah. Agreed. Anyway, I think that's awesome. Good question. Yes. All right. Guys. So let's, let, let's flip the script now. Uh, as a, uh, <laughs> as a Pi Kappa Alpha, how has that experience uh how do you yeah. translate that experience as a kappa into your business it's, life it, it, well you know uh, i can say a few things so so i started off what's now called missouri science and technology it's, it was university of missouri Rolla. so 35 guys from my high school went there engineers that's a big group so i studied electrical engineering just like dad but met a great crew i moved in with 28 freshmen 90 guys in the house i lived in the house but they taught me discipline you do duties hey you know you cook you clean you learn how and i mean it's like boot camp for kids and i think boys and girls everybody should do it so that was good transferred into umsol joined another group of guys in umsol i started marketing to the other pike houses in missouri for parties in the summer so i again social so again i'm an introvert i'm comp sci math i'm the guy that can i just go write code and Fast forward, I've got guys working for me nine years now that are Pikes. Um, I meet Pikes at other other partner organizations. So even today, the relationships so many years later, it's just interesting. It's no different than my high school chums in St. Louis. We still connect. And so Pike, Pikes have been good. It's been social. It was, I learned as a kid. And um, you have to learn Robert's rules of etiquette and gentlemanly like conduct, which is good. <laughs> it's good. There's, anyway, you get it. Not everybody has... Uh, my mother's from Chattanooga, so you know that southern thing really went well. That I, I had right. manners. That's anyway, right. so a few things, like I said. And then, uh, do you take clients hunting and fishing, or is that just a I solo I, uh, experience? <laughs> it's, it is a lot solo, but uh, but I do. I my I bought some property. It's about thirty five minutes west of my building, so I have one hundred twenty two acres out there, and I will run people out there because we can go out play for two hours and be back in a three hour round trip. But I have a, a Honda UTV and I have a, a few different things that are fun to shoot. And uh, yes, so I bow hunt, rifle hunt. And uh, I have about six deer stands out there, shot four deer this past fall, three with a bow, one with a rifle. And, um, and I enjoy it. It, it. it really gets me out of the building mentality. And uh, 
but yes, I do take uh, workers and other people out there. So That's cool. Do you eat your cat? Fun. Do you eat what you shoot? I donated a lot of food this year. I mean, I donate the venison. I fed a lot of families and even turnkey this year. We did 20 family dinners for Christmas, 600 pounds of food we gave away. So we did, I don't want to give people money, but I will feed you all day long. And so that was the big deal at the end of this year is let's feed people. And we donated a lot of venison and a lot of it came back, tzatziki, brats, uh, snack sausages. And of course I gave it to the workers. And then of course, like I said, we donated hundreds of pounds to, to several different families. So that's it. It's, there's a program here where you can drop, drop them off $25. It goes to an orphanage or you process it and you just give it to people. And uh, but that's been the strategy. It's not a, it's not a wasteful thing. So. Yeah, so you think me being this one of the cyber nerds on the call, I'd be asking you more of those nerdy techie questions, but I'm more interested in, bit, in you as a person. <laughs> No, it's all right. It's good. It's fun. And this many years later, you get introspective and you're like trying to help others. And even, and I've been very successful. I can't complain. And, uh, but we're still, we're still killing it. And it's, but it's, how do you, how do you do the right things for the, the staff? And like I said, we're close to 60. We've got to hire a lot more people this year and uh, they need to grow, like I said. And, uh, but no, I, it's good perspectives. So. All right. One, one final non-technical question. Then we'll let uh, Al and Chris have at you. Hockey or baseball? You know, the Cardinals were a client and the Blues were a client. So I had them both. Um, and I lost them both. But yes, I love them both. Um, so I'm, I am uh, St. Louis Cardinals. I've been up in DeWitt's office, the high rise. You know, the Cardinals are up in the ceiling. The Blues are in the basement. It's so funny. But uh, we still service the Blues organization. But no, I love both teams here. Um, <laughs> well, listen, you know, clearly a lot of challenges uh, for companies as they are growing and, and the need for some good strong ERP and CRM is critical. And it, it's interesting to hear that Microsoft has jumped that hard into the business and they're trying to grow that. Uh, and, and listen, I think they do a good job against competition, right? They, I think, as you said, they'll eventually get that product to a point where uh, it will become dominant more than likely. It's, it's, we're beating, I mean, on the, on the big one I sell, I compete with SAP and Oracle and I compete with NetSuite and we win in a good number of times. And on the smaller end, I mean, there's a lot of, a lot more competition there, but, but to your point, yeah, they put a lot of money into it in the application. They bought a lot of stuff, so they don't want it to be short. So uh, I think they'll win in the long game because of their overall cloud strategy. It's more than just an app. It's a platform. And uh, I mean, it's still fun for me. I'm still going to play for another 10 years, I hope, and running this business and growing it and, uh, but it is, there's a lot of innovation showing up and it's exciting stuff. I'm sure you guys, you know, the rate of change is still pretty aggressive on, on what's, what's relevant and what actually works to that point, you know? Yeah. Right. So, right. Well, you said innovation, Chris, because, because probably my, my last question, I guess we're even long. My last question really is going to be around that word innovation. And I mean, you think about how long you've been in business and you think about uh, how things have changed. What is, forget where we are now, forget, COVID, I hate to say it. Uh, what do you think a roadmap that Microsoft's coming out or what you were seeing in the field that you think is going to be the big change in your industry? That you, 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 you've you switched your road, everybody has their own roadmap. When you roadmap your company, what is it that you're preparing to change because you see some type of change in the industry occurring? Yeah, and that's, that's a change that I began a few years ago. And I think if we think about traditionally, we licensed where we'd have big transactions and then and to transition from those types of licensing to the subscription SaaS model. For a lot of businesses, that's compromising is because you have a cash flow problem. We've transitioned that and we're, we're doing very, very well. So I think that, you know, my doubling down on Dynamics 365, uh, Microsoft, my stats, I'm 82% year over year growth. So they're loving me because my numbers are just cruising. We can look at 21 and calculate, you know, what we're at the beginning month times 12, and we're up 20% over last year on licensing without selling a brand new transaction. So, so that sustainability and Dynamics 365 is really where we're betting. I mean, again, we traditionally had the legacy on-prem customers, and if they were 70, 80% of the revenue to make that transition in revenue streams, and again, we've overcome that now. And so, as I'd say, we're, we're throwing gas on the fire at this point to drive the growth, but uh, that's it. It's for me, it's Dynamics 365, but keeping it narrow, that's, that's, that's one of the keys to us as well as the focus. It's interesting. So, so when you look at the innovation, you're not thinking of a technical innovation. You're thinking of the business innovation. So. Biz apps, biz apps. And again, I logically get the extension into AI, Azure Analytics, and, and those, those features are right there. We're, we're not focusing on the modern workplace, but again, around the biz apps, because they've extended it for us into the Azure Analytics and the AI and stuff, it's a natural extension. And again, BI, right? So BI is on top of everything. So as you think about tip of the spear is ERP, but then there's so much that continues to swell behind it 
based on Microsoft innovation. We had a group recently say, hey, can we bring Halo Lens into our engineering department? Sure. Again, behind the tip of the spear, that's not the first thing we talk about Halo Lens, but in the engineering department with CADS, yes, all the virtual mixed reality technologies come in there. Will we add specialists to rep that? Again, I guess it depends on what the opportunity is. But So, so, so let me rephrase it just, just to kind of come to sure. a conclusion. So you're saying that from, from your perspective, the biggest innovation is you engage customers is your, is your way you package your money, right? How you engage financially with a customer and the way you innovation in the industry itself, you're seeing is that Microsoft has really taken the Great Plains software, right? And finally begun integrating it with the rest of the platform to be more consistent and leveraging things like the AI and the cloud capabilities of Azure. Yeah, to clarify, it's not Great Plains. Great Plains is one of those legacy on-premise products. Yeah, it's Dynamics sorry. 365. But yes, after 18 years, they acquired these things. It has become totally sub substantial. So, And that's uh, where we're doubling down on that because as we look at the growth curve on that top product line, for me, I could generate you know 200% growth on that product in just 21. So that's the long-term game. And the rest of it is just finding the people. So it's a people game behind that. You know, Licensing is an easy transaction having staff to do the implementation and service those applications is really the biggest challenge for the organization over the years. Are you finding complementary technologies to work with Office with uh, Dynamic 365? In other words, like um, other products that you feel enhance that product line? So we do have a relationship, we call them industry software vendors. So if you imagine me adding on an e-commerce, a full commerce platform, that's an example of extension through a partnership of a, an industry software vendor, but they're typically biz apps they don't, they don't transcend into the infrastructure side of the business unless we're, again, all the, all the mobile workforce stuff and the mobile apps are all part of the solution. So even extending into the workforce is, is not really, it's not an add-on at this point, but industry partners is the way we describe that. So are you happy they make with, a difference. Are you happy with Mindcast? I, you know, for me, I mean, I, it's, yeah, I like the security layers. I mean, I'm, I'm the owner, risk mitigation, right? You know, so I'm told my guy, you got a budget. Just don't, let's not have a problem. Let's not have a ransomware. Again, we've gotten rid of all of our on-prem or apps or we almost don't have anything on-prem. Our last app is moving up. And so again, it's sustainability and it's resilience. You guys are in the space. You understand that is how do we do that? Everybody's multi-factor. Like I said, there's a lot of other layers, but it's just another layer. But so far, yeah, you know. Um, are you using the what, Office 365? You use the Mindcast as an MX firewall? That's words. No, yeah. it's, a, it's the MTA. Actually, exactly. Mimecast is actually the the sending and receiving server on behalf of his domain, right? Yeah, that's what it, it's a security. It's, it's a, a it, it's a seg. It's a full seg. Yeah, yeah. yeah so it's a dynamic firewall. Okay. So anyway, right. sorry. I, team, I have a new IT manager who's came into the audit and said, "Guys, let's tighten it up," and that's what they've done. And so it's not a it's that's not a, a big great, expense to give a, you a confidence, right? Microsoft. Uh, I'm sorry. We're, yes, we're Microsoft partners at Fortify. What I meant to say was Mimecast. Right. We're Mimecast for we're Mimecast partners as well. So it's great. It's a great product. Highly endorsed. We're on the Mimecast website. We love them too. That's right. All right. Yeah, you get promotional for them. Well, my yeah. IT manager may email you if we need some more <laughs> cyber services because you know, like I said, we no, no, it's it. it's interesting. I mean, basically, the reason why I find that an interesting twist is like we were just talking about with Dynamics three sixty five. You don't have that type of combination, but when you get to like Microsoft Mail, right? It's very common to have an MX firewall to take your MX record and put it through a secondary security provider. In this case here, Mimecast. Another one would be Proofpoint. Uh, Fortinet. Iron Scales, one. Fortinet. And, yeah, yeah to, to clean up the incoming. And it's, I hate to say it, it's because Microsoft traditionally, and I shouldn't say traditionally, consistently doesn't really care about security. No. Um, and so they're late you, to the party. Even the CMC, CMMC is new because so even GCC high, you got modern workplace in Azure, but dynamics are like, ah, we're going to get to that. So there's not a dynamics GCC high off the shelf solution. You have to get your Azure and you have to deploy it manually in there and then manage it manually. So there's a lot of, you know, it's not a, it's not a perfect world. And to listen, your point, you know, uh, you know, as, as, as a, as a person that was represented with the government back in 98 and going to visit Microsoft, they explained to us that we were only 15% of their budget and you wouldn't make 15% of your clients determine your direction. Um, Ouch. So that's, Ouch. You know, like that. that's Microsoft. Xbox, right? Xbox, you know, <laughs> money. And you know, you're like, they got rid of the phones and you know, you think about where's their hot Azure, Azure's their big baby and in, in modern workplace, 
dynamics is important. Don't get me wrong, but Azure and Modern Workplace and you know, like I said, that's the, those are the top three for them that they're looking for the long-term growth. But yeah, there's been a lot of other products Chris, in there that have, you know. Chris, Chris, in our industry, we say we're very thankful for Microsoft or we wouldn't have jobs. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they create. Without, the people, without Microsoft, people remediate. don't get hacked. Yeah. <laughs> no, and that's why you can we're like, okay, no, we don't help with that. I know there's, yeah, there's problems there, but uh, we can, it's, you know, there's a lot of people that hate Microsoft. Me, it's like, like I said, it's been, they've been a good partner for me for so many years. You can imagine that uh, I have been around. Most of my friends up there are all retiring. I'm like, seriously, you're quitting already? And they're like, we've been doing this since the eighties. It's like, okay, whatever. No, there's nothing wrong with Microsoft as far as, listen, we use them. We, we use them definitely for, as an infrastructure play. They're fantastic. Uh, the difficulty around Microsoft is they don't know when they're bad at something. Yeah. And they 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 want to be involved in stuff they don't know how to do, and they try to convince people through marketing that that things are fine. And the reality is, it'd be a lot better if they said, "Listen, we don't get this spam crap. Go out and get an MX firewall." Yeah. Or we don't, you know, they want to get an AV right now, and yet they don't want um, to share their logs. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's 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 a shame that they came up with twenty different versions. They have E one through five, and yet they've got eight different ways to buy office. Resources. I know it's confusing. It is confusing. It, it, and that, that hurts them. I know it does. It really yeah. is. Everybody you need like a, a decoder ring and you know, the new licensing guy came out in January, it's 80 pages and people are like, I can't even understand that. Can you interpret that? So no, we, we do understand that. And it's, it's delayed their success in my opinion. To of that course. Degree, but. Yeah. Libre office is free and it's a hundred percent compatible just for anybody out there. Libre office. Right free. <laughs> they tried to push that in the FAA at one point. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, so so Jeremy, you want to take me out? You want to bring in him? Him book. We're on to your second beer, so I need to have at least two more minutes of conversation, or this isn't going to go well. Oh, you're on to my beer now. I'm on to your beer. I finished mine. Okay. Now I'm on to yours. Okay. <laughs> so so, Chris, so I guess Chris, for you, here's a question: What is your ideal customer? Who are you looking to attract at Turnkey? Hmm. Well, you know, and yeah, the, the demographics, it's, it's, it's typically number one, it's, it's somebody that's actively looking to replace their biz apps. Again, they, they've got a legacy ERP solution and it's deficient and, and they're active. You know, you know, there's the ones that are in denial, but certainly an active customer that knows he needs to replace his biz apps and they have complexity in their business and they have budget, you know? So again, target industry, are they 50 million plus? Those companies have resources to work with is the best way to put it. And, uh, the more complexity, which means manufacturing, right? It's manufacturing, it's distribution, it's finance, it's service, it's returns. It could be a lot of things, but that's that's the sweet spot for us is that size or larger. Um, too big is not perfect, but again, someone that, that really knows that they need to, to do something better and, uh, you know, and they're ready to engage. You know what I mean? Because we have a lot of people that aren't really ready to engage. We're like, look, if you're, if you just replace it, you're not going to talk to us. But, uh, you know, if you've got something that's 10 years old and it's limiting your business, come talk to us because we want to open those opportunities for them to grow the business. You know, the, the, the enjoyment we have is when they succeed, not when they just stay the same. You've got to take that thing and be able to go. So at what point is a customer ready to transition from a fresh sales CR or fresh desk CRM or Zoho into a dynamic solution? What so is in a, the... in a, and I think, you know, I don't know all those products, but normally there's a, a shortcoming on it or it's just, you know, I mean, historically I knew Act wasn't great at multi-user. Okay. I don't know if that's still a problem, but people said, look, I need more collaboration. I need more interaction. And, you know, one of the things that comes out of Dynamics 365 is you get all the built-in governance, which means if you extend it, you're not building all the security and stuff and you get all that and you get the integration. So part of it is feature set jump. It's, it's, it's complexity. I need to configure my processes a little more complex. I want to do integration with the pro buy them and plug them in and then deal with just gaps. You know, I mean, and back in the eighties, we built a lot in the nineties, we built less now plug it all in where the gaps fill the gaps. So I think that's, that's it. And, you know, a lot of people have legacy systems that they've augmented and customized. And a lot of times it's easier to start over and just take a fresh look at your business process that you need to manage. Right you know, I go back to my corporate days where uh, many a times I've watched brand new SAP implementations and millions and millions and millions of dollars later never ever get completed because of the complexity and difficulty. How do you distinguish the Microsoft Dynamics ERP to that type of uh, scenario? 
um, much more intuitive. In fact, we're presenting to a, a group of 600 users that are leaving SAP and they were like, oh my God, it looks so easy to use. So to your point, the complexity. So as you look at 365 platforms, um, they have learning built into them, meaning our, our finance and supply chain product has task recorders where users can get click through illustrations on how to complete a process. So it makes it easier for them to learn. And I think that that's that's a big differentiator. It's easier. It's more intuitive. You're like, oh, that looks familiar. Never seen it before. That's, you know, so there's a lot of advantages of that. But again, the process navigation, like I said, there's a lot of tools in there that help on a sustainability standpoint. And you're right, SAP, it's, it's huge, it's complex, and, uh, and it's very costly. And so that's why people are excited to kind of move down if they get that opportunity. So, well, you know what, Chris, it's been a pleasure having you this evening, today. I've enjoyed it, guys. The coast Thank you're you. on. Yeah.